Thank you for tuning in. You're watching Arirang TV's special coverage of the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm Min Son Hee. The government revealed a stimulus package yesterday, which is expected to provide relief funds to some 70% of the country's households as part of efforts to ease the economic fallout in the wake of the outbreak. Aside from the financial support, the government has also been shouldering the cost of testing and treating confirmed patients of the virus, regardless of their nationality. We have more on that in today's coverage. But first, as always, we have the headlines with Kwon Soa and Nuaram. Welcome. Hi. Hello. So perhaps we can start with the domestic updates. I understand a cluster infection in Tegu is raising concerns. Right. Uh, almost 60 infections have been traced to a hospital in the southeastern city of Tegu from Monday through Tuesday. In total, at least 134 people have contracted the virus at the second Miju hospital. And another case has been reported just this morning, bringing the number to 128 patients and six medical staff. And this is the largest largest number of cases confirmed at one single facility in the city. Of course, apart from the group infection linked to the Shincheonji Church of Jesus, a religious sect that's blamed for the massive spread in Daegu. And a nursing home inside the same building also confirmed three new cases, bringing the number to 94. So 228 people have been infected in that building in total. And that is also why Vice Health Minister Minister Kim Gang Nip said at Tuesday's government briefing today that cluster infections at hospitals and churches remain a major source of COVID-19 infections. Now, with this new cluster infection, the new number of uh, new cases jumped to 125 this Tuesday. That's 47 more than was reported on Monday, bringing the total number to 9,786. Four patients have died, raising the death toll to 162 and more than 5,400 people have been discharged from hospitals after making a full recovery. Now let's take a look at our map here. Uh, standing out of course Tegu 60 cases, Gyeongsangbukdo has two more cases and the metropolitan area is another concern with Seoul uh, having 24 new cases, Gyeonggi-do province 13 and Incheon 6. Uh, 15 new cases were meanwhile detected at quarantine checkpoints at the airport. Uh, meanwhile President Moon Jae-in at a cabinet meeting on Tuesday uh, urged for strict legal measures against people who um, violate any quarantine rules and he made this uh, call a day before the 14-day self-isolation measure takes effect on all arrivals from abroad. I see. And speaking of abroad, I understand numbers in the U.S. are climbing at an alarming rate. Mm -hmm. uh, really, the U.S. has more cases than any other country now with also new hotspots emerging. And also on Monday, the U.S. reported the uh, biggest number of uh, daily uh, deaths with uh, more than 500 deaths uh, with the virus taking a total of 3,000 lives. Now, where the death toll is worse than in any other country is Italy, which accounts for one third of of all global fatalities with more than 11,000 deaths. The country has also surpassed 100,000 total cases. It extended its lockdown to at least April 12th. And Spain has become the next country to have more cases than China. And Spanish Princess Maria Teresa became the first member of a monarchy to pass away from COVID-19. Uh, France has reported its highest coronavirus death toll in 24 hours. Uh, hours with 418 patients dying. Uh, with the worsening situation abroad, South Korea is continuing its efforts to evacuate South Korean nationals from worst hit nations. In fact, the first of two government chartered flights is expected to depart from Milan on Tuesday night local time and another from Rome uh, the following day. And speaking of Rome, we'll be connecting with an academic expert there later on in the program. But first, Adam, I understand schools will be starting virtually next month. That's right. There will be online classes starting April 9th. That was the announcement made by 
Prime Minister Chong se gyun uh, he said the move to introduce online classes will be applied step by step. So depending on the grade of the school, the starting date will differ. And a briefing on the matter is actually taking place as we speak. And details coming out are suggesting that middle, uh, middle school seniors and high school seniors will start on April 9th. So they'll be the first to start the school semester. And then the elements so of the early grades, like the elementary first to third grade, will start school uh, on April 20th, uh, as it uh, seems, uh, according to the briefing. Uh, at the moment, uh, the schools, as we know, this is the fourth time now that they have been delayed. Uh, they were initially uh, postponed for April 6th, so a few more days uh, later they are planned to start. And uh, the, PM, the Prime Minister said these remote classes were a viable alternative for students to learn and for schools to meet the statutory uh, yearly school years as well because there is a mandated number of days that the school uh, acad academic year needs to take place. Um, the biggest question though is for the high school seniors because they have the national college entrance exam which will obviously be uh, taking a hit because of these delays and the announcement again just moments ago has been made it will be postponed to December 3rd, which is known as CSAT here in Korea. So CSAT will take place on December 3rd. That is two weeks uh, after the initial date of uh, November 19th. Now, despite the government's plan, there are still some concerns about the technical infrastructure with these online classes. We saw universities start with online classes as well, but with, they ran into some hurdles with technical glitches and servers breaking down because so many people were logging in at one time but considering universities have more students the scale is obviously different so i don't think schools will have that much of an impact mm. Mm. on the economic front g20 mm. finance ministers and central bankers are holding another meeting is that right that's right so they'll hold their second round of obviously a video conference so a virtual uh, meeting on tuesday to push ahead with their coronavirus response the G20 Leaders Summit, which happened recently uh, last week, in fact, pledged what they called a united front against the COVID-19 uh, outbreak, saying they were injecting five trillion US dollars into the global economy, which has taken a massive hit uh, through this pandemic. And President Moon Jae-in in that summit as well also shared his, uh, the country's Korea's know-how on the fight against COVID-19. Now, Saudi Arabia, which holds the group's uh, presidency for this year, said the ministers and central bank governors will discuss how to advance a coordinated global response to the COVID-19 pandemic and its human and economic implications. They are also expected to discuss how to help poorer countries, which uh, lack capital markets or uh, any adequate health facilities as well. They are more vulnerable to that. Now, the G uh, G20 trade ministers uh, also recently had a meeting on Monday, in fact, so just a day before, and they agreed to keep their markets open, so they're all about open trade still. Uh, they also agreed to ensure a continuing flow of vital medical supplies, especially in this, uh, in this climate, which is even more vital. So medical supplies, equipment and other essential goods as well. And they also vowed to prevent profiteering and uh, unjustified price increases as well in case of people uh, wanting to exploit the situation. Right. Back in Korea, many foreigners who had been sidelined in the country's mask rationing mm. system are now a will now see changes, I hear. That's right, because many foreigners had been sidelined with these uh, face mask rationing system that has taken place in Korea. So this five-day rotational system where Koreans and foreigners are like with national health insurance uh, by a face mask on a certain day, depending on the last digit of their date of birth. Um, and so these foreigners without these national health insurance are obviously left out and the Seoul Metropolitan Government is giving a, a helping hand to them. They are providing a mask to each of them and five replaceable filters for these cotton masks. So they are washable as well and uh, they will be provided with five replaceable uh, filters. A total of 100,000 masks will be distributed, so not everyone will be allowed. There is a cap of 100,000 for the, all the foreigners without a national health insurance. And they will be available at some 40 universities in the capital, as well as the Seoul Global Center, which is a, a kind of support center for so uh, foreigners in central Seoul in uh, the Chongno district, in fact. And the government made it mandatory for foreigners to uh, residing in Korea for at least six months to apply for national health insurance. So obviously there are still a lot of people who haven't applied for it. There are a lot of exemptions uh, as well, including foreign students, not just expats. So they will not be left out this time. 
All right, Adam, thank you for that. And Sua, thank you for your update as well. We are now poised to join the Central Disaster and Safety Countermeasure Headquarters for the regular briefing on the COVID situation here in Korea. A mass outbreak, outbreak that is, at a hospital in Daegu, the epicenter of the virus here, has reportedly raised the tally to three digits again. Meanwhile, elementary, middle and high schools in Korea are expected to start their semesters online from next month. Now, for more on those facts and figures, we turn now to the regular briefing. Right, and we can see they have yet to come up to the podium. So while we wait for them, perhaps we can go over the numbers today for Korea, where we had 125 new cases, raising the total to 9,786. And we've just had an announcement that the briefing will start in a couple of uh, seconds. They're still waiting for the official to approach the podium. And as our No Aram said, for residents, foreign residents that is, here in the capital city, you can get masks at the Seoul Global Center. We turn now first to the briefing. Let us now begin our regular briefing for March 31st, Tuesday, on the coronavirus outbreak in South Korea. As of today, midnight, the total number of confirmed cases stands at 9,786. This includes 518 imported cases from abroad. There are 42 uh, foreigners, uh, meaning that 92 percent of them were uh, Korean nationals returning from abroad. And of the total, 5,408 have been discharged following full recovery. And on the uh, increase of the confirmed cases was 125. And we are seeing a decrease in the number of uh, those who are uh, on quarantine. And we had five new more deaths raising the death toll to 163 so far. And by region, we saw 60 more cases in Daegu, which was the largest portion yesterday. And nationwide, 83.3% uh, were related to cluster infections. And by individual cases in Seoul, uh, there is uh, the Manmin Central Church in Kurogu District, Seoul, which saw 10 additional cases from the day before. And now we have uh, 30, 133 patients so far. And we are currently uh, tracing the contacts of the confirmed cases. And as for Gyeonggi-do province in Uijeongbu at the St. Mary Hospital, we have seven more cases and we are tracing their contacts. And starting from 16 to uh, yesterday of March, we saw one confirmed case who was inpatient and additionally this spread to six more patients and the uh, entire eighth floor has been closed down and we are screening all of the 200 medical staff working there. And in Daegu, we saw the second Miju hospital, and we also conducted screening tests for all of the 2,500 people who are patients of mental hospitals, and about um, 230 people have been tested negative so far, but we are still waiting for the results of the uh, screening. And in light of the increase in the number of inbound, pa uh, inbound patients from abroad, we will uh, be starting a more intensified quarantine measure for all foreign uh, inbound travelers starting from midnight of tomorrow. And looking at the breakdown, yesterday we had 29 um, imported cases, uh, 13 of which were spotted at the airport, and 16 were uh, reported by the community. And 14 of them were from the Americas, and 12 from Europe, and one was from Asia, uh, excluding China, and excluding two, all of the rest were Korean foreigners, uh, Korean nationals. And starting from April 1st, all of those who are coming abroad 
coming from abroad will be mandated for self-quarantine for 14 days. And uh, for these short-term foreigners, uh, they will also be uh, needed to go under self-quarantine. But if they do not have residence, they would be moved to a designated center. And a failure to abide by such measures will result in um, imprisonment up to one year or fine up to 10 million won. And persons of foreign nationality who fail to comply may be subject to measures including deportation and entry ban. And the KCDC also uh, urges that in order to treat uh, the coronavirus patients, Patients. We are seeing the therapeutics, uh, but we see that uh, the therapeutics have not yet effectively been developed. Therefore, we are trying to utilize guidelines to utilize uh, the, um, the blood as well as the antibiotic from uh, those who have been confirmed to treat uh, the new patients. And this was also being applied for MERS here in Korea to treat those patients. And we also witnessed some of the successful cases in China where this therapeutic was successful. Therefore, the Korean government is also providing similar guidelines. And until April 5th, the government has promoted uh, the enhanced social distancing campaign. And we continue to urge our public to refrain from uh, religious activities or indoor fitnesses or sports facilities or other uh, activities that make it easy to come in close contact with others within enclosed space. We also ask you to keep your personal hygiene. And last but not least, today, we would like to address some some of the messages to uh, the medical staff. Some of the medical practitioners have been uh, infected and we reported you on the latest figures. We are still under uh, going investigation, but in quarantine, we would like to thank all of those who are exerting their full efforts and dedication to help uh, the front, help in the front lines. And in Tegu region at the disaster site, despite the difficulties and risks, many of the medical pr practitioners are exerting their full efforts uh, and treating uh, the patients. And we also so would like to thank all of those uh, who have volunteered to go to the front lines to bat combat uh, the uh, COVID-19. And we would also uh, admit and acknowledge that uh, the foreign press also lauded on uh, such uh, uh, dedications by the medical staff. And uh, the government is also in line with uh, providing the support uh, to these medical staff. However, during the briefing, we believe uh, that some of the announcements on the figures of the medical staff's uh, infections had some misunderstandings and there were some uh, difficulties in conveying uh, these messages to the public. So as uh, the respective uh, employee or staff, I would like to apologize for any misunderstandings. And going forward, we would continue to provide a transparent uh, information as much as possible so that we could ensure a more healthy and safety uh, ordinary lives for the citizens. Thank you very much. Right, that was the Central Disaster and Safety Countermeasure Headquarters with the latest numbers and information on the COVID situation here in Korea. We have 125 new cases today, raising our total number of infections to 9,786. Meanwhile, for foreign residents without an insurance policy here in, cap in the capital city, Seoul officials are planning to provide face masks with replaceable filters. They'll be available at some 40 universities and at the Seoul Global Center, a support center for foreigners in the capital. City.
The costs involved in the testing and treating of COVID-19 cases in Korea are free, regardless of whether you are a Korean or a foreigner. Now, this is not the case in many other countries. And in today's broadcast, we talk about the healthcare policies surrounding the tackling of the outbreak. For more on this, we have Kim Young-jun, U.S. Attorney at Law. Welcome, Mr. Kim. And we have Stan Varivoda, a correspondent for Russia's TASS News Agency. Hello, Stan. Well, nice First, we'll start with you, Mr. Kim. Yesterday, the government uh, unveiled a stimulus package designed to help people with the economic fallout from the COVID-19 outbreak. Included in this package is uh, talk about a slash in insurance costs for those in the low income bracket. What are your thoughts on these efforts? Yeah, I don't have the full details of this particular aspect of this massive economic stimulus and rescue um, uh, package. Um, as the government is um, uh, feverishly trying to um, roll out the program, they are filling all the missing details. But it really depends on whether this uh, premium alleviation measure is a temporary suspension or reduction or is a long-term fixed one. Uh, in the context of the national health insurance uh, scheme, I think the insurance uh, premium adjustment should be uh, made in that overall context as opposed to just a portion of the participants. But on its face, uh, it sounds like a very reasonable measure to help the uh, economically uh, affected uh, lower income households. So I'll, although I'll ultimately reserve judgment on it depending on the details, but I think on its face it's like a reasonable measure under the circumstance. Right. Stan, are we looking at similar efforts overseas? Uh, well, I can say for Russia that we, we have a little bit different um, healthcare system there. But all the costs uh, for the COVID-19 are being covered by the government for now, including the uh, expatriates and foreigners and even the illegal mi uh, migrants that uh, are currently present in, in Russia. Mm. So, uh, and uh, the, the Russian authorities do not find this excessive because it, uh, as it has been mentioned, it takes just one traveler to, to make, to infect the whole population. So. Of course, that's true. Well, the Korean government has chartered several flights to bring home hundreds of its citizens who are currently in Italy, which is home to the second worst COVID outbreak. Now, to learn more about the situation there, we have Dr. John Fanti uh, from John Cabot University with us live. Hello, Doctor. Good morning to you. Hello. Let's begin with the overall atmosphere in Rome, which is where your school is situated, I understand. All non-essential establishments have been closed for a while, right, Doctor? Exactly. All over Italy since uh, March 9th, we have been in a lockdown. Everything is closed, schools, businesses, non-essential uh, activities, only food, uh, distribution, People can go out of their house only for food shopping and um, pharmacy doctor visits, and that's it. How are Italy you? Is, uh, no, yes. I'm go sorry, ahead. go ahead. No, I'm saying it's uh, a surreal uh, atmosphere to see Rome deserted. Uh, Rome that is a center of tourist travel, and it's nobody's around, as you can see from the images. Right, it really does look surreal. Uh, Dr. Fanti, how are you coping with the outbreak personally? I assume that it has disrupted your work routine. How are you getting supplies? Yes, um, for me personally, of course, it's been disrupted, but I've been disrupted, but um, I can afford to stay home. You see, the problem is for millions of Italians that live from paycheck to paycheck, and they are really suffering now. And uh, three weeks into this shutdown, they're wondering how long would it last? Um, the government is trying to help them uh, with the emergency aid, but uh, how quickly would we'll get in the hands of who needs it? That's the problem. How are the uh, people there responding to the containment measures, uh, doctor? Are they abiding by the guidelines set forth by the government? Okay, yes, this is a topic which is of interest because nobody uh, expected Italian to behave so well. Uh, Italians are known to be creative, but also undisciplined. And this time, I think they are scared and they are really um, cooperating with the uh, social distancing measures. That is encouraging to hear. Uh, Dr. Fanti, yeah. um, could you tell us a bit about the testing procedures in Italy for COVID-19? How much do they cost? Okay, testing is uh, free, is uh, offered by the public service of the government to everyone. Um, the procedure to access testing has changed over time and is still not homogeneous. 
across the country and across Europe. Um, people uh, are before getting the test, they uh, have to show symptoms, and so uh, now there is um, there is an effort to give tests to everybody to expand. The, the testing and they look at Korea as a good example of uh, of uh, procedures because um, I think you've been very effective in uh, in testing everyone. Doctor, one last question for you: What are what is something well concerns from the public at this moment in light of the COVID nineteen? What is what is one of the major concern among people there? Major concern is how long would this shutdown last, and will we will it be effective i think people feel there is no plan b we are doing everything we can we're staying home social distancing and people are praying that there's going to be a vaccine or a cure soon <laughs> there's not not else not much else people can do now except waiting that is true. Well, the number of new cases have been slowing down in Italy, I understand, and I do sincerely hope that this means the worst is over there. Dr. Fanti, again, thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much for being here. Good luck. Now, Stan, we've heard from Professor Fanti that Italy is still under a nationwide lockdown to contain the virus. I understand Russia has also implemented uh, movement restrictions and it's closed down its borders too. Can you tell us a bit about the situation there? Yeah, of course. Uh, uh, Russia have uh, closed the borders since the end of March and uh, there are no inbound air flights, no outbound air flights, uh, only a few ones to pick up the, the Russian citizens who are stuck abroad. So uh, this week, uh, from the beginning of this week, the government announced the uh, lockdown in Moscow and in St. Petersburg. As, uh, Moscow is now becoming uh, the biggest uh, transmission hub, I mean the, the, the biggest cluster of infection. Out of total uh, 1,800 cases in, in country, uh, the Moscow has uh, 1,300 cases. So uh, the situation is uh, quite serious and uh, uh, the Russian mayor also, uh, he said that uh, about 20% of the uh, citizens ignored this uh, self-isolation and uh, they broke, uh, they, they went abroad, they uh, uh, organized picnics uh, in the parks, etc. And uh, so the, the Russian authorities are considering some other enforcement measures to make those people to stay at home uh, because they are not only menace to themselves but also to, to the society. And uh, also the Moscow government announced that there will be uh, payments made to the retired people uh, who would uh, be on, on self-quarantine. The, so the first half of the payment they will get in the very beginning, on the first day, and uh, the second half of, on the last day if, them, if they com uh, comply with, uh, with uh, the lockdown. And also the unemployed people will be getting a payment of about 200 US dollars. I see. Uh, going back to the uh, testing and uh, treating of COVID-19 patients, for here in Korea, like I mentioned earlier, the uh, treatment and testing is free for Koreans and for nationals. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, ultimately, it comes down to the Korean government's, I think, wise decision that it is not an action of charity or um, um, you know, humanitarian issue, although it is a humanitarian thing to do, but it is in the national interest of the Korean uh, people in the sense that the protection of public health requires um, testing everybody as much as possible and treating as much as possible because um, it is in the public health interest. So the, the, the cause of protection of public health is what drives the Korean government not to uh, make distinctions based on nationality or income level uh, because at the end of the day, virus doesn't really discriminate against gender, income level or nationality race. Uh, it is an equal opportunity um, uh, attacker. So uh, in fact, the Korean government's uh, um, uh, approach in this regard is widely regarded by foreign press and other governments as a, as a model of public health leadership in the sense that uh, the focus should be really on identifying and destroying the virus rather than, identi uh, based, uh, rather than treating people based on identity and income level. So I think uh, it is definitely a right approach for the government. And ultimately, it comes down to the government's decision that 
to pay for this cost uh, for testing and treatment upfront as a society uh, will be cheaper than dealing with the aftermath of not testing and treating and uh, potentially suffering and likely suffering much larger costs as a society. So prevention is better than cure? Correct, because you'll have to pay one way or the other and better to pay upfront prevention costs as opposed to a much wider uh, issue later on. Right. Mr. Kim, the government is also providing basic livelihood securities to those in quarantine. I understand the amount will depend on whether you're in isolation voluntarily or involuntarily. Can you explain this for us? Yeah, as a lawyer, I can make the distinction between people without fault versus people with fault. In this case, it's not necessarily fault as such, but um, without fault meaning people who are deemed to be exposed because of the third party's action or government's action. So you are, quote unquote, uh, uh, forced into the situation of having to quarantine or isolate yourselves versus people taking voluntary action of traveling or entering the country and otherwise, in this case, mostly uh, arrivals from other countries. Um, but. Uh, so you can make that distinction. I know people often make the reference to Article 40 of the IHR, International Health Regulations under the WHO, which people, I think, um, don't necessarily understand correctly. Article 40 really does not mandate the country to uh, provide these things for free. There's paragraph one talks about enumerated instances of vaccination, isolation, and quarantine related expenses, and says you cannot charge these expenses to others. Uh, visitors, travelers in this case. But paragraph two talks about other than those things, you cannot charge and transfer costs to other people, or in this case, visitor, visiting travelers. Government can transfer costs to travelers if it is for the convenience of or for the benefit of the traveler. So that is the paragraph two people don't really focus on. You only talk about article one, which you cannot. So um, Korean government is taking a much broader view of what it is responsible for providing, not necessarily because of what WHO ICR mandates, but because government has determined, as I said earlier, that it is in the interest of the uh, Korean uh, national uh, public health protection to co cover this as widely as possible, not because of some mandated WHO regulation. So that also means other countries can make a different interpretation as what this part of paragraph two allows in terms of, well, I don't have to cover this thing. So we can talk about that later in terms of uh, well, how same regulations are viewed by different governments. And for example, Singapore is not taking the approach the Korean government is taking. So it's imposing more costs on the travelers as such. Mm. Uh, Stan, you talked about the costs for uh, testing and treating uh, being paid by the Russian government as yeah, well, right. right? What are your thoughts on that? Do you believe that that is the right way to go about this issue as well? Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. Uh, uh, this costs, uh, the, the prevention is better than dealing with the consequences. So uh, uh, you, you should not discriminate with, between the, the people who are locals or migrants or whatever, because the, the, it's a national uh, health security issue. So you cannot just uh, discriminate between them. Right, I see. Uh, and Mr. Kim, you're talking about Singapore, of course. So you do believe that. Do you believe that Korea has a right approach then in like footing the bill? Yeah, or? but ideally every country should do that. But that's ideal. But obviously um, we still haven't seen, unfortunately, um, much coverage of what's happening in the developing world. And if the most advanced countries in the EU and the United States are having problems dealing with this issue on a massive scale, you can imagine how uh, it'll be dealt with in the developing world, which we haven't even you know, started scratching the surface yet. So um, in principle, what is desirable is one thing, but whether individual countries and governments can really afford to do with these things, that's really the issue. So again, um, like in public health debate in any country, uh, this again uh, magnifies the difference between haves and have-nots between the countries as well as within the society as well. So it is a sobering debate that uh, in the whole world has to uh, engage in, in, in the coming years. Mm. Uh, well, the U.S. has become the new epicenter of the virus mm. and patients, well, people, they already face huge medical bills, I understand. We also had a case of a teenager in California who is probably the first um, U.S. minor to die from right. the uh, COVID-19 uh, disease. He was reportedly turned away at an urgent uh, health care center because he was uninsured. Now, right. These are rather disheartening stories. What are your thoughts? Yeah, again, um, it's ironic that this uh, crisis is happening in the U.S. presidential election year because um, in any U.S. election year, whether it's uh, every four-year presidential election versus every two-year congressional election, health care reform is always a dominant issue. And um, um, there are a whole range of different ideas, even within the Democratic Party, let alone uh, including the Republican Party. 
uh, key factors to remember in the United States healthcare system is there's no one national healthcare system. Um, there's a public hospital system, private hospital system. A lot of insurance, uh, health insurance are provided through employer basis. In other words, university-wide, company-wide, um, some organization-wide. And if you're not in uh, this group insurance uh, scheme, then you take advantage of Medicaid for low-income families and Medicare for people who are 65. Even those federally mandated program, Medicare, Medicaid, are administered through state governments. Every state has different philosophy as to who should or shouldn't be covered, what kind of procedure it has to go through. So in the case of this uh, unfortunate teenage in Los Angeles, um, he was first, I understand, uh, based on the limited facts that I, 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 I uh, got hold of, uh, went to um, um, either private hospital um, or out of network hospital, but I'm told he didn't have insurance, so it must be a uh, private hospital that didn't have to take in uh, the emergency room patients. But if you're, and then uh, as I read the story, he was then in the process of being transported to a public hospital ER, but it was kind of too late during the transit time. So again, because of these systems, even though those who have the uh, private health insurance, um, there are differences between in-network hospitals and doctors versus out-of-network. In other words, each insurance company has a list of hospitals and doctors that insured can go to, and in those cases, the costs are reasonable, but if you are in an urgent situation where in some other area you are just forced to go to an out-of-network hospital with doctors, then the costs can be really skyrocketing. So those are the things um, that are just really hard to see in other countries when there's one national health insurance system. So hopefully, um, this year has been kind of, you know, for lack of a better analogy, petri dish for different healthcare system coming out differently around the world. Uh, hopefully that's a positive uh, experience in, in, in that sense for the U.S. Uh, general population to look at this and get engaged in a really serious, healthy debate on where the national health insurance uh, uh, debate should go. Mm. Stan, what are your thoughts on, the, on what sounds to be a very complex healthcare system in the U.S.? Um, that's really, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I never researched that. Uh, uh, the American system, but I heard from a lot of people that it's way too complicated, and even from the Americans themselves. So uh, probably uh, some some sort of reform should is is needed, and maybe this case with the uh, Los Angeles teenager would would help to change the, the entire system. It's uh, it's really uh, too complicated, too ri ridiculous. To, to get, if you need some urgent health care, then and you have to wait and travel to some certain hospital. Of course, that, that, that doesn't do well. Right. Mr. Kim, South Korea not only uh, offers the free testing and uh, treating benefits to foreigners who are legally here, but also to those who are here undocumented. What is your view on this? Yeah, it's sort of similar to what I alluded to earlier in the conversation in terms of Korean government making the determination the top priority really should be covering as many people as possible regardless of their uh, legal status, income status, or whatever. So this goes under the same umbrella of taking a non-political scientific approach is what is best for the protection of public health in Korea. So um, again, this is uh, um, alluded to my, by many of my friends who are overseas looking at the Korean situation saying how it is really most progressive and humanitarian approach, not discriminating uh, against um, uh, undocumented uh, 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 foreigners here. But that doesn't mean Korea is uh, uh, completely uh, free from xenophobia and fear of uh, the uh, uh, illegal uh, aliens. You, have, you, know, you may recall Yemen refugee crisis in Jeju only a couple of years ago. So that is there. But here, government has made the truly right decision of uh, what is best for the public health and that is to cover as many people as possible who are here, regardless of the question, because you don't want to force uh, people in a difficult situation in terms of legal status to hide in the background and potentially exacerbate the problem. So Korea government has definitely made the right decision. Right, I would have to agree. Now, aside from paying for people's medical bills, the Korean government has also been praised by the foreign media for its speed and volume of testing. In fact, since the country is in innovative drive-through testing centers, other new forms of testing facilities have been set up. Let's take a look.
드라이브 스루는 사실 차가 있는 분들만 가능한 사실 검사 방법이라고 할수 있습니다. 실제로 어르신들이나 아니면 아주 어린 애기들 아니면 차가 없는 분들은 실제로 검사를 진행할 수가 없기 때문에 그런 점이 가장 큰 단점이라고 할수 있었는데요. 차가 없이도 거, 걸어 들어와서 검사를 진행할 수 있는 그런 부스를 개발했습니다. 확진자 접촉하거나 이런 적도 없으셨고요. 네, 시간이 많이 짧고요. 대면을 하지 않고 유리창 넘어서 대화를 하고 진료를 하기 때문에 아무래도 그런 위험성, 그런 전염성에 대한 우려가 많이 뚫어는 상황이고 줄 서는 것도 짧고 검사도 길게 하지 않고 이렇게 단순하게 빨리빨리 끝나가지고 그냥 뭐 걱정 없이 잘 하고 가는 것 같습니다. Whoever came up with this idea, I think it's a very ingenious idea because um, it didn't take much time, it was pretty fast, but despite all of that, they were pretty strict about all the quarantine uh, measures and therefore I think it's a very reliable and also a very a fast way of diagnosing the coronavirus. Today, 스탠, what are your thoughts on Korea's testing uh, centers? Do you believe Russia would be interested in adopting something similar? Well, I'm, I'm quite impressed, I should say. Uh, it's uh, really innovative, uh, high-tech, I would even call it a cyberpunk uh, kind of um, science fiction <laughs> booths. Yeah, uh, I think it's, uh, it's very important that it's not only time-saving, but al also it uh, uh, greatly reduces the risk for uh, medical personnel that are uh, most vulnerable. And I think with time, maybe uh, Russia right now is uh, on the crossroads. We, we do not really know how shall things evolve with the coronavirus. But uh, I think it's a good idea to use such booths and all the ideas uh, that South Korea have implemented, like the drive-through uh, test centers. Uh, yeah, I think that, that would, that's a very interesting idea. Right. Uh, Mr. Kim, could you share uh, with us your final thoughts on why we would need universal health provisions in the case of an outbreak that hits the globe, like the one we're having right now? 
Right, as I mentioned several times, public health uh, by definition is for the protection of the public, general public, not specific individuals. And that is a key difference between public health and clinical health. And the United States is a case where it has the best clinical medicine in the sense that if you have a rare disease, uh, if you have some complicated uh, uh, conditions that nobody has seen before, the United States has the resources and the best doctor and most innovative research. The problem is it has a very frayed and decentralized public health system. So without the robust public health uh, system in the background, uh, clinical medicine, no matter how superior it is, is really, really difficult and uh, inaccessible to most people. So that is really the importance of public health. And that public health system can be uh, uh, really meaningfully uh, bolstered by uh, national, centralized, uh, some sort of sensible uh, healthcare system that people can rely on uh, in good times and bad. And also, this is why it's so important to have uh, this public health discussion uh, managed by uh, scientists and medical pro professionals without the politicians. And one example is uh, I was really surprised to find that Japan has no CDC, unlike uh, Korea and the United States. Um, and the uh, Japanese situation is governed by the health ministry, uh, and it's obviously dominated by uh, Abe's cabinet by political reasons. So uh, even when they try to um, get hold of the situation, it is a political decision. That is the, one of the key differences between um, uh, countries that have a professional CDC like in the United States and Korea versus Japan where it doesn't have a CDC, I was surprised to find out. So that's why um, listening to scientists and medical professionals is so important and not too much on politicians. But politicians have to come up with solutions based on the scientists' recommendations. Right. Okay, Mr. Kim, thank you for your thoughts, Stan. Thank you for being with us today. Thank Hopefully we'll see you again. Me. Now, well, that brings us to the end of today's uh, coverage. We'll be back tomorrow at the same hour, so do join us then. In the meantime, Arirang TV welcomes your thoughts and inquiries through our social media accounts or our homepage, arirang.com. Thank you for being with us.